How do you grow a rock star YouTube channel? How do you become super confident if you are a man? What happens if you suddenly quit booze for 30 days or six months or a year? If you have an idea for selling products, how do you sell products? How do you turn that idea into a reality? How do you get millions of followers? Not just hundreds or thousands, but millions of followers. And then how do you help dudes pick out underwear and talk about manscaping? <laughs> We're going to be talking about all of those topics. It's a kind of weird selection, isn't it? Uh, but our guest today uh, is a gentleman by the name of Aaron Marino. He's a YouTuber, an entrepreneur. He's a men's lifestyle mentor. He has a, a YouTube channel which started in 2008 and now has 2.33 million subscribers. He sells hair products. He sells confidence. He's always immaculately dressed. And uh, I first came across him when I saw season four of Shark Tank, where he was unsuccessful in getting a deal from, uh, from the billionaire entrepreneurs on that uh, very successful television program. So we're going to be talking, a few thing, uh, talking about a few of those things today. Aaron Marino, welcome to the show, sir. Great to see you, James. Thanks so much for having me. So wait, did you see season seven of Shark Tank where I went back? I didn't see season seven, but I know you did go back. I, uh, you can't stop the story halfway, James. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to the story. Don't All worry. All right. Sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. And, and from what you said, I'm excited to be here and uh, hear what I have to say. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Well, um, I got to tell you, when I first stumbled across you, uh, I checked out your YouTube channel and I was, I was thinking to myself going, you know what, this guy doesn't seem that alpha male to me. Because I grew up in like Australian culture where it's all like, you know, being a tough guy and whatever. And I actually had a, a program called Alpha Male Club. And this podcast, this very podcast used to be called Alpha Male Club. And so I was looking at you going, this guy's immaculately dressed. I'm not sure that's very alpha male-esque. And then I was thinking of like David Beckham and he's immaculately dressed and he wears a sarong sometimes and does weird things with his hair. And I, so I kind of didn't make that correlation between alpha male and, and well-groomed. But I've, I've subsequently changed my entire viewpoint on that. And now I'm like, it's very alpha male. So what are your thoughts on that in terms of, you know, the alpha male image? But you also know, it was it, the, the whole name alpha M and, and that sort of that, the, the, the brand behind it was just by accident. Um, years ago, I was starting an image consulting firm and I was trying to come up with a name. What said macho, what said guy without being too like king of the jungle consulting and alpha male or alpha M sort of, sort of transitioned or transpired as a result of that. When I started my YouTube channel, I never even really gave it a thought. I didn't really think of what I was actually putting out there. And the fact that by naming yourself Alpha M, people were going to definitely form or have an immediate reaction or opinion. And what I've come to realize over the years is that my version of alpha male and what it means to be a male in today's society and an alpha male has, has morphed and it has changed. I think that the, the, the man in today's world needs a whole different skill set than our fathers or our grandfathers did. Um, it used to be an alpha male was quintessentially the strongest leader. He walked in a room, boom, he command presence. He had panache. Now the alpha male is a little bit different. He's got to wear a lot of hats. He almost has to be a renaissance man. He's got to be in touch with his emotions, but at the same time, he's got to be confident and and understands the value he brings to the world and does his best to lift people up with them as opposed to keeping them down. And so my version of alpha male has definitely changed as I've sort of gone through this, this evolution myself as, as well as this YouTube journey. It's funny when I first started the, the show and it was called alpha male club and, and people would ask me, Oh, what's the name of your podcast? And I say, it's alpha male club. Women would always have this kind of like, Oh, that doesn't sound very good. you know? Like that sounds kind of aggressive almost, but in actual fact, the show was, was, was all about helping men be better men and showing up for their, for the women in their lives. And, and, and it actually was, was, you know, everything that if I'm making men better then obviously women are going to be happier and that's going to improve relationships. 
But it's funny that that negative connotation around. And is that James? Is that why you changed the name and the branding of everything that you're doing? It was one of the reasons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and one of the reasons was that because of the name and the negative connotation with it. The other reason was actually that I got fed up and tired of just talking about men's issues. I, I actually liked talking about women's issues as well, and I didn't really want to pigeonhole myself into I'm just the guy who talks about men's issues. My interests are, are vast. Yeah. Um, so. It's, it is true. The idea of what a, an alpha male is has transformed over the years. But what's your view of just a good man, like a strong man, a considerate man, like a man for 2017 as we're, as we're recording this? Yeah, um, I really feel like it's somebody who, who is in touch with his emotions. He's not afraid to communicate and express himself. Um, he's curious. He is constantly trying to learn and doesn't, doesn't feel like his ideas or ideals are so rigid and, and one dimensional that he's not open to exploring other options um, and other, other viewpoints. Um, and he's a provider. He provides for himself. He does the hard work and he might not necessarily be where he wants to be ultimately, but he's motivated to, to try and, and try his best. So if someone's listening to this right now, there's a, there's a male somewhere in the world, across the world, listening to this right now, if he doesn't feel like he is any of the things that you just described, what would be your advice to him? My advice would be to start helping people. The first thing I would, I would say is to do something kind and generous every day for somebody else. And it, it sounds sort of, sort of funny, but the, the benefit that you get from helping other people is, is remarkable. And it, the feeling you get, not because you get a reward in terms of anything monetary, and sometimes people might not even notice, but the fact that you're doing something for somebody else that's selfless, in my opinion, is the first step to really truly finding your, your confidence in that inner voice. Um, that would be sort of the, the place I, I would start if I were just listening and I didn't know what else to do. Start helping people every day. Yeah. Do something. They've done studies that have shown that the moment that you help someone else is the moment that your dopamine levels increase. Your did you see the, did you see the, uh, the, uh, the documentary or the movie happy? No, I haven't seen that. No. Ah, uh, you got to check it out. Um, it's called happy. And what they found, I think what you're referring to is that, that helping somebody else is the, 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 response in your brain is equivalent to antidepressant drugs yes. and really the only thing that does is they the premise behind this movie which was fantastic is that everybody sort of has a happiness level or threshold sort of mm. like tolerance with alcohol and you might win the lottery you win a million dollars and it might go up but it's going to settle back down to normal really fast Correct. something really bad could happen to you you're you're your mother get, could get killed in a car accident and it sends you down deep, dark places, but quickly you're going to rise back up to that level. They found that the only thing that truly changes that level and raises your happiness threshold is helping others. And so um, that's obviously something, you know, they thought of it, I didn't, and, and they're much smarter than I am, but I, I know that as I get older, I, I should listen to smart people and do what they yeah. say. <laughs> One of my top five books of all time is called Happiness Hypothesis by a New York professor called Jonathan Haidt. And he said exactly the same thing. They did all these studies that if you are depressed, if you're sad, if you're like lonely, if you go out there and just do one act of kindness and help someone, you can literally just not, not entirely wipe away your depression, but sure. your happiness level increases exponentially. Right now on my wrist, actually, I'm wearing... A, a reminder it's uh, from a company called one kindness a friend of mine john wang who's been a, a guest here on the show um, is the the producer of these things and you wear it on your wrist and all you have to do is one kind act a day and when you do it you just flip it over and there's the heart with the tick through it so it's just a daily reminder that just do one nice little helpless sorry not helpless but selfless thing uh, every day and you're all around happiness will increase. And if you are happier, happier people make more money and people who make more money are happier and healthier. And if you're healthier, your relationships are better. And it just has this ongoing, uh, ongoing um, spinoff effect. So um, we're talking to Aaron Marino, who is uh, a YouTube star, I guess you could say if you've got 2.33 million subscribers, you'd have to say that you're a star. His uh, <laughs> YouTube channel is called Alpha M and you can check out his website at I am Alpha M 
Um, Aaron, just give us a little bit of your life story first, if you would, and then we'll delve into a few other subjects. But sure. where were you born? Where did you grow up? And how did you become this, this men's lifestyle mentor and grow this now 2.33 million <laughs> all subscriber by accident, channel YouTube? All by accident. Okay, I'll give you the quick version. I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, uh, my parents got together super young. We grew up very, very poor. They got divorced. Um, I went through my mother, um, I think in, in an attempt to find stability for me was, uh, she was, she had, she made some bad choices in men. Uh, ultimately I, growing up, I had two abusive stepfathers, um, nothing physical, but the mental stuff is, is equally as, as traumatic. Sometimes I think more so. Uh, but the one gift that she gave me when I was 12 years old was a fitness membership to a gym. And that's what changed everything for me. Um, I might have had a crappy home life. I might not have really felt great about myself because in these relationships and being around um, abusive people that were, you know, you lose your voice. At least I did. I lost my ability to stand up for myself. And so when you do that, your self-esteem really takes a nosedive. But when I went to the gym, I felt amazing. I felt like I found my home. And at that point, I realized that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So, you know, 12 years old, I knew what I wanted to do. Long story short, I graduated from college. I went to West Virginia University, degree in business management, minor in um, community health promotion and marketing. I was going to open a fitness center. I moved to Atlanta. I met a guy. We opened a nutrition store. It was close. It wasn't the fitness center, but it was, uh, it was close. The problem with the nutrition store, we were incredibly successful right away. We opened three of them in the span of a year and a half, was that my partner wanted to sell drugs out of the back because apparently illegal drugs are much more profitable <laughs> than vitamins and, and protein powder. And so I was around 22 at the time, and I didn't know much, but I knew that prison wasn't a place that I would thrive. I'd be popular, but I would not do well. And so um, I left and I started a, uh, I was a trainer at a fitness center. One of the women, however, that I met at the nutrition store, I helped lose a hundred pounds. She came to me and said, uh, I want to help change, change people's lives like you did me. And, and I want to open a personal training studio with you. And it was like jackpot. This is incredible. This is what I've been waiting for my whole life. And so we did that. It was a lot of work. Um, she put up all the money. We signed the lease to our location on September 11th, as in the September 11th. Wow. And it should have been an omen because that's pretty much the trajectory at which the business was going to take. Um, Long story short, we, we tried to expand. We tried to raise um, extra money to, or we raised investment capital to franchise this, this concept. And um, it was going well. We were running out of money. Um, I was in debt over up to my eyeballs. And um, ultimately, we ended up having to shut down because um, there were some legal issues with one of our investors and my business partner, Linda. And um, it was the most devastating point in my life. At that point, I was, I was so broke and I had no income that um, I was actually driving a beer cart at a golf course. And um, it was horrible. And I, the problem with me is that being an entrepreneur, I never had a plan B. It was plan A all the time until obviously something drastic and, and bad happened. Um, and so I, I, my wife gave me a video camera and I decided that I was going to try to make a, make a YouTube video. I had no, no idea what YouTube was. I didn't know what a subscriber was. I didn't know any of it. Uh, previous to that, I had started an image consulting business because it was something that I was passionate about, I really liked, and I thought there was a market and you could charge a lot for it, apparently. And so um, I started posting videos and that's what changed my life. Um, you know, fast forward till today and, um, you know, my life is just, I mean, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the world. The fact that I get to do that, um, I get to make videos, I get to make content, I get to help people and I get to make a, a living doing it. And so that's it. Do you remember what the first video was that you recorded and stuck up on, on YouTube? Yes. The first video was just an introduction, uh, introducing me to the audience. And it was just, Hey, I'm alpha M. If you've got questions style related, let me know. And it was really bad. It was two minutes long. It was like 180 P in terms of the quality. Um, but from that, I got a question. Somebody left a comment 
And they asked me, it was actually the second video was, was how to dress if you're a big dude or a big guy. And all of a sudden I realized I had a voice and I found my home and it was, it was, it, it hooked me immediately. It was this interaction. It was this, this, this engagement, this back and forth. And I made my second video. And then the next day I made another one because somebody else asked me a question and it was, it was like a drug for me. And, um, and today I, I still get the same rush going in to film my videos as I did the first day. Did you ever question yourself and say, why are people asking me this? Why, like, no one really wants to know what I think. Or were you really confident in your own ability to be able to give advice on style and grooming and, and things like that? I always sort of had, had confidence that I always knew that there was a market for this because when I started the image consulting business, it was one of those things where there weren't that many resources out there for regular guys to get basic advice on style and grooming. There was GQ magazine, there was Esquire, but that wasn't applicable to me or my friends or my dad. And I knew that if I had questioned how to shave my testicles, somebody else probably has too. <laughs> and so at the time I was sort of cutting edge in the turn in, in, in the sense that I would talk about anything. There's really no topic that's off limits. And um, I was very comfortable in my own skin to be able to, you know, sort of give the information that I felt people might want to might want to hear about. So you started recording these videos and sticking them up and then you started getting comments from people. And then in the first, say, six months, what happened? Like in terms of like, was it a slow growth of, of YouTube subscribers it, and followers it, or was there like a tipping point where it just exploded? I'm still waiting for the tipping point. I will tell you this. It took me, what was it? Six, six years to get 100,000 subscribers. And then it took me 16 months to get another 900,000. Wow, that's amazing. So just say that again. So it took me, uh, what was it, six years, or I forget what, it, I think it was six years to get 100,000 subscribers. And then it took me 16 months to get an additional 900,000. That's amazing. And, and, and so, but YouTube has changed a lot in, in its algorithms and the way that it promotes people. I've seen people nowadays sort of have a message, do some things that are right, and really start to, be much more successful than I was in the span of like months as opposed to years for, for me. Um, but part of it is just the function of YouTube has changed the way that it actually promotes and, and recommends people. It's funny, you know, people always say it takes 10, 20 years to be an overnight success. You yep. know, it's like, <laughs> look at Ricky Gervais, who was a British comedian who slugged it out for many years before all of a sudden producing that hilarious uh, BBC series, The Office which then later on was picked up by NBC in the US and they did an American version. It took him 20 years to be an overnight success. Uh, George Clooney didn't really make it big until he was in his late 20s, I think maybe 30 when he got his main, when got his main gig. Um, uh, there's another great example I'm trying to think. Uh, Judd Apatow, who is uh, now considered like the comedy king of, of, New York, of uh, Hollywood movies and... and um, he produced uh, Knocked Up and uh, he produces Girls on HBO yeah. and he does the 40 year old, he did the 40 year old Virgin movie. Mm -hmm. and, um, he didn't really strike it big, I think, until his late, late thirties, I think it was. And then you got stories like Ray A. Kroc, who, who really, you know, built McDonald's into the global fast food empire that it is. He didn't really hit it big until he was, I think in like 55, 50, mm -hmm. early, early to mid, mid fifties. So it does sometimes take many years to be considered an overnight success, right, Aaron? Uh, I, that, that is what I, I have heard. <laughs> and I know in my experience, that is definitely true. Um, you know, people don't see the, the, the long hours and, and days, months, weeks, and years that it takes to, to get to a certain level of success. But yeah, it's definitely not, I've never, I don't know what overnight success actually looks like. Yeah. Um, worst uh, hater email message that you've received. Can you describe it for us? Like the worst comment, nastiest comment, funniest, nastiest comment. <laughs> um, you know, YouTube is one of those things and, and the comments are one of those sort of aspects of YouTube that, that you're not really ever, I don't think prepared for. Because 
I know at least for me, regardless of how good I feel about myself, you could be teaching blind kittens to read and somebody would have something super negative to say about it. Um, and it, for me, it never just bounces off like Teflon. It's always, it, it always hurts a little bit. I mean, you know, criticism is never fun on YouTube, on the web. It is, it is, it is multiplied tenfold because the anonymity, these people are saying things to you that they would never in a million years say to anybody face to face, but because it's safe and there's that autonomy, um, you know, or anonymity that, that, um, that they feel, feel that it's okay. Um, I've had really crazy things. Um, <laughs> everything from, I've, I've called the police to find out what my options are. I've had really, uh, crazy stalkers. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's a, that's a whole nother conversation, but there is, uh, some crazy, crazy people online. When you say you had some crazy stalkers, was it a, was it a, a woman or a man? It was a man. Okay. It was a man. And uh, yeah, it's, it was a man that was just sending me just incredible amounts of, of very disturbing content and, and emails and, and threatening my family. He would, he would walk right up to the point of physically harming me or my wife before he'd back off because that's where the, the true harassment and crime starts. Um, it's gotten better in terms of the, the, the laws have gotten a lot more um, protective of people online and they're having to adapt and adjust based on just sort of the way that we live nowadays. But it's, it's, it was tough. Well, what, what percentage of haters do you get to people who post uh, either positive or? Oh, it's not even, and that's the thing. It is the, 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 the positive outweighs the negative a million to one. Right. It's, and that, that's it. I mean, don't let that or criticism stop you because the, 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 the love and the passion and the, the, the people, the community is just so much, uh, it's just amazing. It's, it's life changing. Don't let those few people dissuade you, but you asked. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so. So, it's so funny. I remember in 2010, I, I was blessed to meet and interview my childhood idol, who is John Bon Jovi. Whoa. And, and on September 7, 2010, uh, I was in New York City and I got to interview him for 20 minutes. Uh, I was filling in for a, a, a journalist friend of mine um, and I got to interview John Bon Jovi. And he's like, uh, anyone who knows, has known me for a while knows that I'm a massive Bon Jovi fan. In fact, look at my little figurine I have here, Aaron. John Bon, yep. There he I've is. Seen him, I've seen him three times in concert. You and my, one of my best friends would, would, uh, would definitely give each other a run for <laughs> your Bon Jovi money. I've seen him 13 times in concert. Ah, so you, you win. <laughs> but anyway, in 2010, I interviewed him. And at the end of, at the, end of the interview, uh, I, I thought, I'm just going to go for it here. And I just started uh, a blog or a, and a YouTube channel around my favorite English soccer team called Tottenham Hotspur. I support a team called Tottenham Hotspur. And so I created this blog called Tottenham Nation. And this was like my first foray into the blogging world. And at the end of this interview with John Bon Jovi, I said, John, is it okay if I ask you some questions about my English football team, Tottenham, and you clearly will not have any clue what I'm talking about, but that's where the humor will come. And I'll ask you the question and then you, you know, play dumb and, and maybe we can, I'll put it on my Tottenham blog. And he said, sure, no worries. And he played along with it. So I asked him these questions like, Mr. Bon Jovi, now that Rafa van der Vaart has arrived at White Hart Lane, what do you think this means for the future of Jermaine Jenis? And then he would, he would give a funny answer. Yeah. Like he said, he said, Oh, he's fucked. And then, yeah. uh, you know, and, and you can actually see this video. If you go to YouTube, you type in my name and Bon Jovi or, or Tottenham, it should come up and, and you can see it. Anyway, I did this video. I stuck it up on this YouTube channel called Tottenham nation. I think it was, or maybe it was my, my James Swanick YouTube channel. And then I posted the, the, the video in, um, a forum of Tottenham Hotspur fans, right, that I was in as well, where we discussed the week's game and who was playing and all this kind of stuff. And I thought that most of these guys would just find this hilarious. The fact I that I've got it. like a rock star talking about an English soccer team and that they would find the comedy and the humor in that. It was well, lost. <laughs> some, people, some people went, wow. Other people went, you shouldn't be posting this shit in this thing. You should, you're not a real Tottenham fan, blah, 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 blah. Like just started bitching. And I was like, what? And I started, I remember I was walking along Houston, um, Houston Street in New York City. And I was looking at these comments 
on my phone and I couldn't believe it. Like I couldn't believe that what was supposed to be this positive thing, this funny thing was all of a sudden getting like negative reaction from so-called my so-called fellow brothers in, you know, the support of our team. Sure. And I was depressed for like an hour. I was walking around. I was like, I can't believe this. And I remember talking to my friend at the time. Well, he's still my friend, Dan Illick, who's an Australian comedian. And I've had him on the show a couple times now. And Dan said to me, Swano, my nickname is Swano. He said, Swano, there's always going to be people who give you shit, mate. Just do what you think is best. Just do you and you'll find people that love you. And you're always going to find people who don't love you. But just like water off a duck's back, man. Just don't let that stop you from putting yourself out there. And I remember, and I always remembered it and I felt better. And from that point on, now I just post stuff that I'm interested in, that I like it. And if people don't like it or whatever. Yep. I like it. That is a good attitude. I'm, <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do my best, but, but no, it's still, you know, the, the, the negativity does get to you from time to time, but you need to just remember that, that, you know, it is the, the very, very vocal minority. And so, yeah. so don't let it dissuade you from starting no, your own channel. No, no, yeah. no, 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 Absolutely. Not at all. All right. So let's, um, let's move the conversation. Uh, before we get into the alcohol stuff, let's actually just give us, give us a few tips for men on, uh, on grooming and being immaculately dressed and, and getting confidence uh, on that. Give us like your top two or three tips. I know you've done, you've done thousands. But just, <laughs> just pick out like a couple of very simple things that, that men can do to make them more confident in terms of their presentation. Sure. Uh, in terms of clothing, finding clothes that fit. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's talked about in every men's fashion blog magazine, but fit is so incredibly critical. And so many men mistake large and roomy with comfort. And, um, you know, there's nothing that will change your image or the way that you look better more than, than just clothing that is, that is fit to your body. And that actually accentuates all your positive attributes and minimizes your perceived negatives. Grooming, develop a grooming regimen. It doesn't have to be that you shave your chest. It doesn't mean that you've got to pluck your eyebrows, but just identify what areas you need to focus on or that you want to focus on and then execute that plan. Well-groomed means different things to different people and that's okay. Yeah, I remember the first time I put on a fitted shirt. I didn't even know what fitted meant and fitted just meant that it was slim, you know, it fit over your body. And I, I remember I'd been working out and I was pretty healthy and fit at the time. And, uh, but before then I'd been wearing what you just suggested, baggy shirts, you know, didn't yep. kind of like fit my body. And I put this shirt on and I actually looked at the mirror and went, shit, I actually look pretty good here. Hell like, yeah. <laughs> you put it on, you're like, what the hell? Exactly. It, it's, it's incredible. Another thing is, is that I'm a big fan of is get a great pair of boots, a leather jacket and jeans and a t-shirt. It is, it is such a simple classic masculine look, but you feel like such a badass and I mean, that's, that's like my go-to outfit if I'm just wanting to feel super cool, but still casual. All right. So I've actually, <laughs> I actually have a date tonight. So, uh, so you can help me with what I was going to wear. Let me tell you what I was going to wear. I was going to okay. wear, wear a gray t-shirt, a black leather jacket, a pair of gray jeans. And then I was debating whether I was going to go with my dark pair of Converse or whether I would wear my nice my brown sh uh, pair of brown kind of boots that I have. So it's great t-shirt, black leather jacket, gray jeans, and then either the boots or the shoes. How does that sound? Is this a first date or second date? First date, going to a sports sports event to chill sports out. Sports event, I'd probably wear the Converse. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's casual, it's fun, but it's still stylish and playful. All right. Boom, there you go. done. Okay. Simple. I'll send so you the bill. So you just, you just confirmed what I was going to do. All right, good, good. Good. We're on the same path. Well like done, it. James. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> good luck on the date, by the way. Thank you very much. You gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll get to the drinking because I know you quit drinking for a while. Maybe yeah. I'm not sure whether you've gone back. We'll get to that in one second. But just for someone who's listening who maybe wants to start a business where they sell products, because I know you sell your own range of, of hair products. And skincare. I have and a skincare company as well now. So I have a physical products business. I'm wearing them on my face right now. These are my Swannies blue light blocking glasses. The, the glasses block the blue light from electronics. Uh, you use them mostly at nighttime um, when you're staring into your phone and you're, you're looking at a computer, you're watching TV. Um, your body's able to produce melatonin. Therefore, you're able to uh, have an easier time falling asleep and getting 
and spending a longer time in that deep restorative sleep. Um, as we're recording this, we actually had our records, a record sales day. So I'm kind of like bouncing on air today because we, we, we did a promotion yesterday and we just crushed it three times what we, what we usually do. Where did, you, how did, where did you run the promotion and what medium? So I, I well, we, we have a Shopify site, so an e-commerce store where we sell the products. Um, and then I just screamed from the rooftops yesterday and said 40% off on the Swannies. And I put it on my Snapchat, my Instagram. Um, I emailed it to the list because we have a list of customers and then also a, a, a list of opt-ins, people who haven't yet bought sure. but have expressed an interest. Uh, and then all over the website, we put, you know, 40% off sale, yeah. et cetera. And, um, and plus we ran some Facebook ads as well. And we ran some, fa some paid traffic and, you know, yesterday was actually, you know, our best day in the 14 month history of the business, which we're thrilled. So I've gone through that process and I've, and I coach people on how to do this. Um, cause I have a, a, a James Swanick in a circle coaching program and I'm putting together a more extensive program to teach people how to build an e-commerce physical products business in general. Mm -hmm. What I want to ask you is, um, what advice do you have for the listener or the viewer right now who has an idea? They've got this idea, but they're not taking action on it. They're not executing on it. So maybe you could answer by just telling us a little bit about what your story was around finally getting a physical products business and what, what advice you have for the listener to take that first step. So for me, once you for me, failure doesn't really scare me anymore. Um, and the, the thing that does scare me is having an idea and not actually going after it and having regret. And so for me, I, because I've had a few successes now, it's my risk is, is minimized. It's also a little bit lower because I've got this, I've built this big community of men and I sort of know what they're interested in. Um, you know, my first sort of physical product was the DVD series that I, that I pitched on Shark Tank. And, um, what happened was I, I developed a system. It was a, an info product that I created into a physical product. And um, it's because I, I am incredibly not tech savvy. So I figured this out. I have a, a physical product. My dad said, hey, how are you going to advertise this? I said, I don't know. He said, you should go on Shark Tank. And so it was a Friday. We were having coffee. That night I went home. I applied. And, and, um, and I, I basically on, on Monday I got an email saying, hey, we'd like some more information. And it was a pretty quick, fast and furious you know, ascension onto Shark Tank. But one thing that I learned when I was out there, I thought that it was the greatest idea in the world. I thought they were going to be super into it. I thought they were going to be incredibly excited. Um, but they weren't. The night the Shark Tank aired, I sold one unit. <laughs> Nine million people and I sold one? Are you kidding me? That told me that something was off. Um, and so about two months later, I was, I was thinking, I'm like, what's the next product? What's the next product? And um, I was styling my hair and, and all of a sudden it hit me. I'm like, hey, I think I could probably sell a lot of hair product because I've got this built-in audience where I'm talking about grooming and hair and styling and all that. And so I went to my hairstylist, we partnered up and um, basically he told me, he gave me a phone number and I pretty much did the rest. Um, and, uh, you know, that product was a pri or is a private label product. What, and was so, the phone what was the phone number to? Sorry, to a It was to a lab to oh. actually make that made hair product and private gotcha. labeled hair product. If you're somebody who has an idea or a business or you want to start a business, there are a few different ways that you can go. You know, you can go the private label route or you can go sort of the, the development route. The one, the private label where you go to somebody else who has the product, you slap your logo on it and resell it. It's quick, it's easy, and the, the, the amount of, of units you have to um, sell or, or, or buy the opening order is much lower. When you go and do something from scratch, it's, it's much more expensive in my experience. Um, my skincare line is completely um, custom created by a chemist and we went to the lab and did the sourcing, it's much more labor intensive. And so there are ways to start. You just got to figure out what's right for you. Um, yeah. So when I started my, my business with the Swannies blue light blocking glasses, we were sourcing them from, from China. So I had the idea to make a stylish pair of blue light blocking glasses up until that point, 
they were particularly ugly. You wear these ugly goggles. You might wear, you're at the gun range or to protect your eyes from like flying stones if you're doing gardening around the home. Sure. So what I did was I put the orange lens into a stylish frame. So I would feel comfortable going out here in Los Angeles and flirting with girls and, you know, having people go, oh, they're interesting. Tell me about those as opposed to why are you wearing a pair of ski goggles on your face? Yeah. So when I went to a manufacturer, it was pretty simple. I was like, I want to put this lens in this type of frame. Now that process took six months. It didn't have to take six months, but I was never done this, never done it before. And so I wasted a lot of time. And then ultimately I had to buy 300 units once I was, was happy with the prototype. Now at that point it was like, man, I'm working out in my, in my head. This is, you know, this is thousands of dollars here, even just for 300 units. I don't know if anyone's going to like this. Should I do it? Should I not do it? And in that moment it was like, Hmm, you know what? It's either short-term pain or long-term struggle. So I was like, I'll take the short-term pain of investing the money and just do it and risk it and see what happens. And in my head, I was like, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is I lose my money and I, and I find out that people don't love it. But thankfully I got a minimum order. It was only 300, you know, I mean, yeah. if I had a choice, I would have said I'll do 30, you know? But yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I got the 300, I launched it on Black Friday, 2015, and we sold uh, three on the first day, then then four, and then five, and then it came back down to four, and then it jumped to eight, and I kind of hovered around there, you know, around underneath the 10, but guess what? I sold out of them. Like, it took a while, but we sold out of it. Yeah. I was like, okay, cool. This is enough. Now, what do I got to do? Well, now I've got to put in a bigger order, and now I've got to go bigger, and then it just sort of, it went from there. It just started to, to build from there. Now, there were a lot of hiccups in between. Um, I had to pay an FDA charge because I didn't realize that glasses or anything to do with eyewear were considered a medical device. So I had to pay this like $3,750 fee to sure. just get the 300 units into the U S out of, from the border, which I didn't know about. So I'm like, damn it. Now my, my costs have, have blown out. Yep. And I remember one guy telling me, he said, dude, glasses are a dead thing. Don't worry about it. Don't do it. Just take the loss and move on to something else. And I said, and this is a guy in an entrepreneurial group, I mean, yeah. by the way. And I went, no, nah, I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm just going to do it anyway. And I'm so glad I did because now we've built a million dollar business in 11 months. And, you know, we're, we're, we're going onwards and upwards and creating like a big sleep, um, um, sleep company. Now, I'm not telling this story to say I'm so special. Look at me. I'm so great. I'm retelling the story because you will doubt yourself many, many, many times. You will. But the difference, I think, be between being an alpha male or a man or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and being a mouse, if you like, or just being average or mediocre, whatever you want to describe it, sure. is feeling the fear and just doing it anyway. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's what – being an entrepreneur, it takes a different type of stomach. It takes a – it takes – being okay with being uncomfortable and you know that old saying you know nothing great was ever accomplished if that was easy you gotta have risk if there's no risk if there's not that little bit of fear in whatever you're doing it's not right <laughs> i think there's probably always going to be fear um with any with any new venture any product that you launch because like you said what if people don't buy it but what's the worst thing that happened you lose some money eh, it's just money and the worst thing that can happen is that you lose some money, your ego's hurt a little bit, your pride's hurt a little bit. But let me tell you, even if the, that worst case scenario happens, you still have experience now. You still have experience of trying. Exactly. You still have experience, which will then move you on to the next goal or open up another door or help you get closer to what does work. Look at Aaron's story here. Aaron went and pitched a DVD of men's stuff. I remember watching that Shark Tank episode and thinking, <laughs> This is a terrible idea because I can get all, <laughs> I can get all this freaking information on YouTube. Why do I need Absolutely. to buy DVD? I'm like, DVDs? Who the hell's doing Exactly, exactly. I'm like, this is the dumbest. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, Alex. no, no. No, it was. And, and, and it's funny because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have had the idea for the hair product company. There you and go. There you I go. went back. They didn't buy the hair product company this time, but they bought me. And I did end up getting a deal the second time um, with Barbara. And it was all about me. 
the YouTuber, the content creator, the, the influencer, that was where the value was. And so I ended up not taking the deal when I got home. I thought about it, it wasn't right, but at the end of the day, it was a successful triumphant return. But if it wasn't for the failure and that stupid product, I wouldn't have a great product. So, so two questions. How did you feel in the minutes after you were turned down for a deal on the first time that you were on Shark Tank? And how did you feel in the minutes after you, were, you got the deal when you returned to Shark Tank the second time? Yeah, the first time it was at first when I didn't get a deal, I left and I thought, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I love how this yeah, I'm going to be on national television. I'm going to sell tons of these. I'm going to be rich. And then reality set in once it actually aired. Um, and so the second time though, I got a deal. And after I was finished, because it wasn't exactly what I went in there to pitch, I get done and I'm thinking about it and I go, oh shit, what did I just do? <laughs> and so, you know, yes, I was excited that I got a deal, but at the end of the day, it was, it was sort of this, this weird, surreal experience where I wasn't sure now if this was the right direction for me. And so, um, but it was exciting nonetheless. Well, what good on you for, for dusting yourself off and going again. What is the website for your products? For, it's Pete and Pedro. PeteandPedro.com. And then there's, I have a skincare company. It's a, it's a monthly subscription system um, called uh, Tiege Hanley, which is Tiege, T-I-E-G-E.com. And that business is going to be the big one. Um, I did something really smart with that business. Um, I started vlogging the process of starting the, 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 the company. Um, and basically I allowed some of my subscribers, whoever wanted to, to come and experience the starting of the company and building the brand with me each week. There was a business lesson. And so I was giving value. And in today's world and the way that we basically consume things in terms of we buy products, we buy products that we connect with on an emotional level. And it was the smartest thing I did was to actually give value before actually asking them to buy anything from me. And so um, that business is just incredible. And um, it's going to be, it's going to be a big success story. I've got uh, three partners with it and um, we are crushing it. That's awesome. amazing. Congratulations. I'm looking Thank at you. it online now. Tiege.com. T-I-E. GE.com looks really cool. Uh, it says introducing Tiege Hanley, helping men look amazing with a simplified skincare system. It's, it's true. Every time I talk about how I built this business of my sleep company, Swanick Sleep, people who end up, you know, people end up being customers that they, they yeah. feel emotionally involved and invested in, in, the, in the, the growth of the business, which is terrific. It's customer loyalty and, and feeling a part of that. And, and it's just stripping back uh, and showing people how you do this business really is powerful for, for you know, selling your own products and building your own brand. Um, let's move the conversation now. Um, we're on the Homewood Stretch here, and we are talking to Aaron Marino, YouTube star, entrepreneur, and men's lifestyle mentor. You can check him out at IamAlphaM.com uh, and his YouTube channel, which is AlphaM. Now, uh, many of my listeners will know this, and maybe they're a little bit sick and tired of, of hearing me talk about it, but I quit alcohol in 2010. Um, I was tired of being hungover, and, and I was a little bit overweight, and I was a bit tired and lethargic. In 2010, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to take a little 30-day break and see how I feel. And after 30 days, I lost 13 pounds. My skin got better. I looked better. I slept better. I was more productive. I started hanging out with a more inspiring type of friend and person. Uh, I joined the gym. I started concentrating on nutrition a lot more. Had all of these amazing um, benefits, including clarity and focus. And it felt so damn good. I just kept on going and I haven't drunk since. And then people kept asking me about it all the time. So a couple of years ago, I started uh, an online program called the 30 Day No Alcohol Challenge. It's now a book, 30 Day No Alcohol Challenge book. If you want to check that out or get your free copy, you can go to 30daynoalcoholchallenge.com forward slash book. And you know, now somehow I've become like a poster child of sorts for, for guys and women quitting alcohol for at least 30 days and maybe more. And maybe they end up reducing their alcohol intake and some of them end up quitting forever. What was your experience with alcohol? What did you set out to achieve and what have been the benefits you found from? from I always, I drank alcohol from the time I basically was in 11th grade until I quit. 
um, I, I consumed alcohol. I consumed too much alcohol, but it was nothing that I would consider myself to have a problem with. It was just the way that I socialized and, and I lived. Um, but one of the bad habits I picked up when I went away to college was using nicotine. I, I chewed tobacco. And I did this for 16 years. I did two cans a day, which is the equivalent to a six pack of cigarettes a day habit. And so you can imagine the level of addiction that was going on with me. Um, and I decided one day that, that it was time to quit. It was the day, it was New Year's, it was the 2nd of January, um, 2000 and um, it was 2012, so about five years ago. And I decided I needed to stop chewing tobacco. I put it down, but I realized if I was going to be successful, I had to stop drinking because it was too much of a trigger. As soon as I had that first sip of beer, I craved nicotine. And so I stopped. And it was the hardest thing I ever did, not the alcohol, but the nicotine. And quitting chewing tobacco is the thing that I am most proud of myself for doing because I have apparently an addictive personality and I never thought that I, I couldn't see myself as a non-nicotine user. But what happened was, remarkable. I don't think necessarily it was because of the nicotine. I really believe it was because of the lack of alcohol. All of a sudden, everything started to get clearer. I was more inspired. I was focused. I was looking at the world differently. I didn't have a hangover every day or on, on Saturday. I was more productive. I slept better. Everything that you're saying, James, was I was experiencing. And I learned things the hard way. You could tell me that, but until I actually did it and experienced it for myself, I would have never learned. I would not have been the guy to pick up the 30-day challenge and actually take it because it was, it was not in my wheelhouse. It wasn't in my, my – I, I didn't think I needed to. But what happened was remarkable, so much so that I have sort of quit drinking. I mean, I will still have – I don't say that I'm a non-drinker because, to be honest, I like the idea of – a glass of wine at an Italian meal. I like the idea of sipping on a nice glass of scotch or a bourbon, but whenever it comes down to me actually doing it, I don't. And I think it's like the idea sounds great in my head. And it's not that I have a problem with somebody else who's drinking. I just know for me, I'm in a really good place and I'm really happy. I'm really productive and I don't want to fuck it up. And if there's anything that I do in my life that is potentially going to derail the, the, the path that I'm on, I don't want to do it. And so for me, the alcohol was just a, not drinking alcohol is a byproduct of quitting tobacco, but the benefits have drastically and far outweighed any drink that I ever had or ever will have. Um, but like I said, I still occasionally will have a glass of wine with my wife at dinner once every two or three months, but it's, I haven't been drunk in probably five years. Amazing. Well, thank you for sharing your, your story, Aaron. That's amazing. And congratulations for the, you know, tremendous health benefits that you get from it. And uh, I don't know about that's you. The, but well, that's the, that's the other thing. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a vain person. I like to be in shape. I like to look good. I like my clothes to fit. Well, I like to look decent with my shirt off. And when I quit drinking, the it was so much easier to stay in good shape because along with drinking for me came binge eating and eating a lot of crappy food going to fast food and taco bell when i you know on those late nights and so by eliminating the alcohol which is caloric eliminating the crappy food that comes with low self or not low self but low um um willpower it was, it was so much easier to stay in great shape, which I also very much like and appreciate. So the benefits are just incredible. And if you try it for 30 days, you will see the difference, period, I promise. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I used to go to the Jones Bar on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood midweek for a couple of drinks. Nothing, not getting drunk, but I'd like have a Bombay Sapphire gin and tonic, or I'd have a glass of red wine, or I'd have a couple beers. And on the way home, there's this cup. There used to be this Carl's Jr. burger right on the corner of <laughs> La Brea and Santa Monica Boulevard there. And most of the time, I would pull into the drive through 
and I would get a Carl's Jr. burger with some fries and a Coke. Well, I think actually I was like, I'll get Diet Coke, thinking that that yep. was going to like reduce the calories. And I'd go <laughs> home and I'd, and I'd eat that. And, you know, I'd wake up in the morning feeling crappy. And even if I didn't have that bad of a hangover, because maybe I had a couple drinks, I felt crappy because I'd eaten shit food before I went to sleep. And then I'm fatter. And because I'm fatter, I'm less... Um, um, less energetic and because I'm less energetic I'm less likely to go for a run or go to the gym and because I'm less likely to go for a run or a gym I don't have as much clarity and focus I'm not relaxing as well so I'm easily stressed and irritated and because I'm stressed and irritated I'm not productive and because I'm not productive <laughs> I'm not attracting productive and energetic and inspirational people into my life and because then I'm feeling sorry for myself I don't make as much money because I don't make as much money I tend to eat Carl's Jr. Burger a lot more so I can feel a little <laughs> bit better and go to Jones Bar to have a couple of drinks just to drown my sorrows because I'm feeling so crappy until I have a Carl's Jr. Burger on the way home at night to make my feel, self feel a little bit better. And you get the point, right? I get the point. The vicious cycle, absolutely. And the productivity, that's something where, I mean, it's like everything has gotten better, exponentially better since I quit drinking alcohol make more money, more productive, happier, healthier. I have better relationships with people. I also don't do stupid shit like I used to. I used to make really bad decisions when I was drinking alcohol. I still make bad decisions, but it's not because my judgment is clouded by the alcohol. And to be completely honest, I don't hate myself when I wake up in the morning anymore. Yeah. Well said. Well, thank you for sharing that story, Aaron. Really inspirational stuff there. We've got a new poster child for not drinking. I love it. I need to share it with someone. So thanks, Aaron. You're very welcome. Uh, Aaron Marino, YouTuber, entrepreneur, men's lifestyle mentor. Uh, make sure you check out his YouTube channel. It's called Alpha M. Uh, as we're recording this, he has 2.33 million subscribers. Uh, if you can check out his, uh, his uh, products, you can go to tiegehanley.com. That's T-I-E-G-E hanley.com. Just tiege.com. I'm yep, sorry. Just tiege.com. My, my mistake. Thank you. Tiege.com. T-I-E-G-E. Uh, and if you want to check out his main website, go to iamalphaM.com. Aaron, this has been terrific, Matt. I really appreciate uh, your time. Thank you for sharing your, your story and your words of wisdom with, uh, with my audience. James, thanks for doing what you're doing. You're really changing people's lives. And so I, I appreciate it and I'm honored to, to be a part of it just for a little bit. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir.